Then Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your own cross, and follow me. Live, die, give. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. Live, die, give. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is there anything worth more than your soul? Live, die, give. For the Son of Man will come with his angels in the glory of his Father and will judge all people according to their deeds. Live, die, give. And I tell you the truth, some standing here right now will not die before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Live, die, give. Good morning, Northeast. Y'all got to be a little bit lively in this. Good morning, Northeast. Good morning. Like, I know that, that, you know, you lost an hour or whatever, but hey, you know, we're in the presence of God. Amen? Amen. And God has been good to all of us. And so, like I said, like uh, Pastor Drew said, I'm Pastor Charles Wright from One Community Church, and I'm here to give you a message and jump into a series you all been having here for the last few weeks or a couple of months here. But I do want to talk about kind of a little bit what OCC is kind of about and, and how we've been doing things. And I'm going to talk about it a little bit in my sermon. Um, but this, is, this sermon today is kind of our heartbeat. And it deals with serving people and serving others. And we're going to talk about that just a little bit and, and how everything goes and how we kind of deal with um, us as a church. Because we have to be the visible church or the visible church that's out in our community. And so let's open our Bibles to Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46. I do want to say, as, we, as you are turning to this text, uh, this would be kind of a difficult text. To, it may squirm you just a little bit, right? This is one that will go very deep and touch us in a way to where uh, it helps us to think about where we are in our journey and our walk with Christ. So I'm giving you that disclaimer before, so as you're turning there to your Bibles, and when I get deep into the text, you won't be shocked. So Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 46 says this. Read along with me as I read out loud to you. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations. He will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right with the goats on the left. Then the king would come to those on his right. Come, you are, who are blessed by the Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the, king, from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king went and answered them, Truly I say to you, as you did to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Then he would say to those on the left, Depart from me, you, you curse, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was, when I was hungry, you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, you did not visit me. Then also would answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he would answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you do not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these went go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. One of the aspects of my life is that I had the privilege and I had the honor to have an amazing father. Growing up in Arkansas, which I still believe has the best barbecue. <laughs> I know Texans are proud about their barbecue, but we are too. 
And you know, OCC just had an event where we did something for firefighters and we cooked and each one of us barbecued and I would just say, just proudly say the Arkansas still rise to the top. <laughs> you know, growing up in Arkansas, my father, who is still a mayor of a small town called Ansonville, and through this, my father has done a lot of things for the community. One of the things he has done, he, he has started a nonprofit organization that went and rebuilt houses, a lot of it in the lower income area. And he built houses for people that could not afford a mortgage or afford to rebuild their home. And he started his nonprofit and he was able to do several, homes, many homes in that area, not only just in the, the small city he's in, but also outside of that. But with that nonprofit, he able to have people to move into homes, nicer homes, better living conditions, and they're able to afford a mortgage that they can pay. Not only that, he is a part of the Baptist Convention where there's a natural disaster. He's all over the place. He goes from different states, and he brings water and supplies to those locations. Not only does he does that, he's a pastor of a church. He serves in that church, and he serves quite well. And so he also serves the spiritual part to people as well. You know, I didn't think about it when I was growing up, how my father instilled in me about serving. I used to get upset when he wanted me to cut somebody grass for free. I don't think any child would want to do hardly anything for free these days, but I know me, I didn't want to do it for free. I wanted to get paid. And my father instilled in me to cut this person grass across the street with, you know, not receiving anything at all. This person was a lower income, fixed lower income, and didn't have the money. And so he taught me to help people, to do something with people. It's within all of this I begin to understand about the gospel. Because the gospel is what teaches us to go out and serve people and serve one another. Without the gospel, we don't understand what it means to serve. We don't really grasp that idea. Because what the gospel does, it changes our DNA. It keeps the focus off of us to go out and serve people and serve one another. And that's always been a heartbeat of 1CC. As we begin to start out, we wanted to begin to serve people. And as we continue, we're still trying to find a way to serve people. I'm not going to say it was easy through COVID. Because through COVID, we're trying to find a way to serve people, and we can't even touch them, right? <laughs> you can't even really been around. We're all in masks. We've got to be six foot distance. So we're trying to find creative ways of doing that. And as we continue on, we'll continue to find creative ways to do it. But I always wanted to be a place where we serve people because it is who we are. It is our DNA. It is who we are as believers of Jesus Christ, the followers of Jesus Christ. We said that we were willing to die for Christ. We were willing to follow him and have the same mind that he does. The Bible says that anybody be in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation. I mean, in other words, we are new. We're different. You know, when we're born, we're all selfish. We want everything ourselves. But when we come to Christ, we change. Our DNA changes. All of us are in the blood of Christ. We have been washed and changed by Jesus. It doesn't matter the color of your skin. We're all brothers and sisters. And I was teaching with one guy, individual, I said, man, our blood is thicker than anything. Because Jesus' blood is thicker than water. You know, you say all the time, blood is thicker than water. Guess what? Jesus' blood is thicker than any other type of blood you think of. Because we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. But to really understand Matthew 25, we got to understand what is our DNA. We got to understand what is that God has done to us to change us, to make us, create us, to mold us into something. What is that DNA? In order for us to understand Matthew 25, we got to look at who we are as individuals. Because if we understand who we are, we're able to be productive in serving people. So let's go ahead and open your Bibles a little bit more. I know that you all probably didn't want to open your Bibles today, and you're in church, but open your Bibles a little bit more. We're going to go through several scriptures, and what I'm going to do is kind of show you what is our DNA. So if we understand that, we can grasp Matthew 25. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Very familiar scripture for most of you all that understand about being saved by grace. And I want you all to really look at this and go through what the Bible says for us. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, and I'm going to read through this, and I'm going to pause on certain things and show you what the Bible has for us. 
It says, and you were, y'all got to give me some feedback now. You were what? Dead. dead. There you go. There you go. You were dead. Now, I have a plant that I know is dead, you know, from what happened through this ice storm or what it, whatever it was. I don't know what this thing was, snow, ice, sliding all over the place, but it, it is dead. And so I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do with this thing. So anything that's dead is not alive. The Bible says that you were dead, that means your past life, in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following this course of this world, following the prince of power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passion of the flesh, carrying our desires of our body and in the mind, and were by nature children around like the rest of mankind. Whew! That's a lot. Jesus, I mean, Paul just described me. You know, you think about in our, in our life, before we came, before we followed Jesus, we didn't care nothing about God. We didn't care anything about following God. And the reality is, we know we say, well, when I came to Jesus, do we really, did we really come to Jesus? Because if I'm dead, how can I come to Jesus? I always thought about that. When, when, you know, I used to say the same thing. Well, I came to Jesus, and I thought about it. Like, if I was dead, how can I come to Jesus? Th that means that Jesus came to me first. That means when I didn't want to follow Jesus, when I didn't want to go after him, when I didn't care nothing about his word, when I was living my life to the fullest, what did God do? Sent Jesus down when Jesus came to me. I grew up in a pastor's home. That was no coincidence. And he even gave me his name. That was no coincidence. Some of y'all that know me know my first name is really Leroy, it's not Charles. Anybody know that? Since y'all my brothers and sisters, I tell y'all this. I don't tell everybody that. <laughs> and, and most people used to tell me when I was growing up, like, yeah, man, I know, you know, when I, was, when I got older and, and I, you know, began to do things, and uh, I went, I don't know where I was, but I went to one place, and the lady was like, and she looked at my name, she said, I know you had to be a junior, because ain't nobody your age named Leroy. <laughs> but all those things are not a coincidence. And I grew up, they called me Charles, and so I kind of continued to win that name, Charles. But all that stuff is not a coincidence. And I went to church, and my dad had to drug me to church every Sunday. And I didn't want to go. He'd get up there and preach his sermon, and afterwards he lectured me like, well, about, about church again. And then I do something, he lectures me about the Bible again. And here we go, and he, with this Bible stuff. Like, man, this dude and this Bible is getting on my nerves. I don't want to live this. And all of a sudden, I begin to really understand the gospel and understand what God has done, and then there's a DNA change. And now look at me. I'm simply preaching in front of you all. And I told my dad, I said, one thing I will never be when I grow up, I will never be a preacher. I guess you can say, never say never. <laughs> but this is our life. Our life before God, we didn't want to do anything for God. We didn't want to walk after God. Our life is that we want to do what we wanted to do. We were controlled by other things. We wanted to do it because of our life. We said, hey, I want to go after my flesh. If it feel good, if it tastes good, if it smell good, it must be good. And then when Jesus came along, it changes our DNA. It changes who we are. And verse 4 says this, But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love, in which he loved us, even when we were, what? Dead. Dead. In our trespasses, made us alive with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Raised us up with him. Seated us with him in heavenly place in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace, and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Here you go. For by grace you have been saved through faith. So when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you've been saved. That's, I think this is rich. So this is like a juicy bone. I don't know if bones are juicy, but it's like a juicy bone here. And he said, it is not your own doing. It's a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Now watch this in verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for what? 
man. He didn't create us to be spiritually fat. He didn't create us just to know the Bible, that's it. He created us to live out the Bible. You know, James said not to be just hearers, but be what? Doers of the word. Right? The whole book of James is talking about how we should live out our faith. You know, OCC is going to go through the whole book of James. We're going to learn how to live out our faith. Doers of the word. So he created us for good works and prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Those good works that he called us to do. In Philippians chapter 10, 1 through 10, also talks about who we are as individuals. And Paul talks about here to the church of Philippi, he talks about his joy. You know, the, the letters always talk about, like, you know, we can do all things through Christ Jesus. We, we love that verse. You know, we, if we open up business, I can do all things through Christ Jesus. You know, we, if I can run around, I can do all things through Christ Jesus. You know, we love that verse. But that verse was more like, oh, I can, when I'm going rough times, I can make it. That, that's really what that verse really about. I can get through it, right? And so you got to understand this. But Paul said this in verse, in verse number one, chapter two, he says, So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy. So Paul says, hey, if you want to make me joyful, you need to do these things. Being of the sound mind, having the same love, being in full accord of one mind, do nothing from selfish ambition. That's, that's hidden in the instant. There's an or conceit but in humility. Do you, do you hear these words? Humility. Count others, uh-oh, more significant than yourselves. Man. I got to think about others before me? What, what is, is we preach out the right Bible? Is this the one? Yeah, that's the right one. Okay. Let each of you look not only to your own interests, but also the interests of others, Having this mind also yourself, which is in Christ Jesus, who though he was in form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a what? Servant. Wow. So Paul is telling the church, have the same mind as Jesus. That means we should be walking around as servants. But if when you really think about this text and you really think about what Paul is trying to tell the church there at Philippi, it seems like there is a tension going on in our lives, in the American church, but what Paul is saying. Paul is telling us to think of others more than ourselves. He said, not in the interest of ourselves, but interest of others, for us to come upon him as a servant, as Jesus' mind. But when you look at us as a church, look at us as individuals, it don't seem like it's there. Amen? That's the tension. You know, when we think of church, it should be a place where we come, learn how to be better servants, go into our community, and serve people, and serve one another. But you see the tension going on here, because a lot of times when you think about the church, we have allowed the culture to dictate what we should do and how we should do things. The culture has dictated who we are, not the gospel. And typically, when we come to church, we said, is the seats feel comfortable? Is the air good? It better not be cold in that sanctuary. It better be nice and crisp. The preacher must be solid. He better make me laugh. He better not make me cry. Does the person sing well on the worship team? He better not crack his voice. Is the music playing well? Is the video showing good, but have good quality? Is the lights great? Is the youth great? Is the children's church great? I'm going to come to church and enjoy myself. When I look at the New Testament, I don't see those terms. I don't see where they're talking about, is it comfortable? I see them want to make disciples. 
I see them want to go into the community and serve people. Even when Paul was commissioned, they told Paul, said, think about the poor and the orphanage. If you think about our church, there's a big tension there. Because what have happened is we allow the culture to dictate who we are. You know, when you think about everything that happened in the pandemic, we were, some of us probably wasn't really trying to serve people. We were thinking about ourselves. We got to understand that it is the DNA that changes us. The gospel changes us because we are individuals that want to serve people. We gravitate to serve because it's a part of our DNA. If anything we love, we will put it first. Anything we love, we will work towards it. Anything we love, I'm telling you, we're all in. And because Jesus loved us first, the Bible says, right? He loves us first, and yet we were sinners. He what? Died for us. Amen? Are y'all awake this morning? I know I'm excited. This is round two for me, and I'm still excited. (laughs) Jesus died for us. And because he loved us so much, we should be doing what? loving others. Because we know how it feels to be loved. Because when we know that we were dead and walking other places and not following Christ and he himself loves us first, man, that resonates. So even when people clown, we can still love them. Y'all must have people in your family that clowns. Y'all must have people in your family that crazy. And some of y'all act crazy. Y'all in the same family, right, y'all? <laughs> and we got to love people anyway. Because our DNA has changed. And that's why when you go to Matthew 25, and it talks about the sheep and the goats. The sheep had a different type of lifestyle. So we look at Matthew 25, and we're going to go through these scriptures here. Matthew 25 tells us this. Point number one, Jesus separates the sheep from the goats. Now, when I began to read this text and began to look at some of the things, I was like, man, you know, Jesus separated the sheep and the goats. And he went as he came. This is after the tribulation. And so people who survived the tribulation is about to be judged. The church have already been raptured. Now, this is after the tribulation point. Jesus comes, set up his kingdom before his millennium time. And so these individuals survived the tribulation. So now Jesus has set up his throne and about to judge. And he separated the people not because of their skin color, not because of social economic status, not because one knows the Bible more than another. He separated them because of their faith and trust in him. So Jesus separated them. Now, I thought about this when I was looking at this because I know me, I started to really look at the scripture and I was like, man, that's interesting that he separated them. He must know exactly who they were or who they are, right? When you think about this parable, this is future tense. This hasn't happened yet. So when Jesus comes, he separates them. So I kind of thought about it for a minute. I was like, Jesus knows the difference between a sheep and a goat. Obviously, I know the difference too. So, you know, I don't know about you all, but you can Google almost everything. And I went online, I said, and I found a quiz on how to know the difference between a sheep and a goat. So I go through, I was like, I know that's a, that's a goat there. It's got horns. I, I know that's a sheep. Look at that. I, I'm going through and I ask the questions. And then when I click to say if I'm done or not, you know, to see what I made, I fell miserably on this quiz. I have no idea between what a sheep looks like and what a goat looks like. Because I don't work in the industry. I have no idea. And so I said, well, at least Jesus knows I don't know. But during that time, those who were shepherds knew the difference. Because they was around all the time. Jesus knew the difference between those who have faith and trust in him and those who didn't. And when he comes back, he separated them. He put the sheep on the right hand, and he put those who were not here, the goats, on the left hand. And then it boils into a number, in our second point, it says this, that Jesus described the lifestyle of the sheep and the goats. Look what he says. He describes their lifestyle. He says in 
verse 35, he says, For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me the drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. You, you got to think about during this time, there were a lot of stuff going on. There were earthquakes, there's tornadoes, there's famine, there's, there's lack of food. That's, that's all this stuff going on in the tribulation period. And what happened during that time, those that were, had their faith and trust in him rise up, and they serve people even though, now watch this, even though, is that a word? Even though, even, anyway, even though they were going through something themselves. They were willing to go out and serve people and serve one another. If somebody was hungry, they gave them something to eat. If somebody was thirsty, they gave them some thirst. I mean, they were getting something to drink. They were doing this in the midst of a tribulation. Let's, let's bring this home just a little bit. What's been going on in Texas, the United States, the world? A pandemic. I believe it is these times, not when the economy is going great, not when there's sunshine at the beach. I believe it's when these times, when it's rough, when it's persecution, when it's a pandemic, when it's problems, is when the church rises up. Were we the ones in Walmart or H-E-B, I don't know which one y'all prefer, fighting for toilet paper? You know, my, my family or, or those I grow, we call it toilet tissue. Y'all know what that is, toilet tissue? That's toilet paper. Were we in the stores fighting, or were we looking for toilet paper to give to others who might not have any? Which I still don't understand why toilet paper has something to do with a pandemic. <laughs> I guess you get the runs when you have the COVID. I have no idea. I still don't get why that we still did that. But were we in the stores fighting? Or were we trying to call people to see if they're okay? Because at first we didn't know what was going on, right? We just didn't know. We just said, hey, let's stay put, see what's going on. But were we really calling people? Were we trying to reach out to them and say, hey, are you okay? Do you need anything? Do you need some food? Do you need anything at all? Do you need just to talk on the phone? I mean, just anything. Did we do that? Or were we in the stores fighting Or were we fighting about other things? Were we fighting a political war? Were we fighting a racial tension? Or were we serving people? I've learned when you're serving people, you just don't have time to get into all those fights. When you're loving people, you ain't got time to be talking about a political war. Because you want to love people. And the church during this time, they rose up. They're like, man, I don't have much to eat. All I got is a can of beans. I'm not saying they didn't say this. Now, I'm just saying. They might have just a can of beans and said, look, we're going to share this bean wall, 50 of us. And we're going to share this. All I got is a cup of water. We're going we gonna to take this. If it's just a drop of water, we're going to drink it together. Because they saw that people were hurting. They wanted to love people so much. The difference that Jesus showed between them and also those who were ghosts was the sheep, they wanted to be, they wanted to love people so much because they gravitate them toward people. Why? Because their DNA was different. Our DNA has to be different. At any moment, at any time for the church to rise up, we got a moment right now to save some folks if we are different. This is what the gospel shows us, that if we are changed by the gospel, we can touch people's lives. I told you this is going to be a little deep. I told y'all, didn't I? Because of the fact that we are changed. Did we really help people during this time? Did we really reach out to people and say, 
What can I do to serve you? Point number three is that Jesus indicated where the sheep and the goats would spend eternity. Jesus talked about the sheep, the sheep, I said sheep, no, that's wrong. English people, people who are English teachers don't get me right now, okay? The sheep and the goats, those are his sheep, went to live in eternity. Those are his goats, went to a place that was not prepared for them. Know what the Bible says. Eternal damnation was not prepared for them. But they went because they choose to. Our faith in Jesus Christ, we live a certain way because of an outflow of who we are. If it's in you so much, you can't help but live it. If the word in you so much, you can't help but talk about it. Whatever is in you, and Jesus talked about the disciples, whatever in a man, you know, it, it comes out, right? What the fowls of man, what comes out? Because what's going in is what's really it's going to come out. And if we are living the gospel like we should, if we, are, we have been changed by the DNA, we are going to find ways to love people. We're going to find ways to love people. So the question really we want to ask ourselves are, what have we been doing? Have we really been loving people? Have we seized the moment to find ways to serve individuals? There were people, I, I, you know, it blew my mind. There were people during a time when we had that snowstorm, and they were asking people, if you have anywhere to stay, you can stay with me. If you need some water, if you need something to eat, I feed you. If you need to take a bath, I got water. This is what Jesus is talking about. It was a rough time, and these individuals wanted to still go out and help people in any capacity they could. This is our takeaway for this. Serving others is an outflow of how the gospel has changed our hearts. Serving others is an outflow of how the gospel has changed our hearts. What would it look like if we are serving people and loving them? And we know for a fact that most people we serve might not get anything back at all. We might not get a gratitude about it or thank you. But what about this, this young boy whose parents are not helping him in his schoolwork? He's going through school, and you mentor him or her and help her to succeed. What about somebody who was dealing with depression and they wanted to commit suicide, but you were there? What about somebody who didn't have anything to eat, but you bring them something to eat? What about somebody who didn't have anywhere to go, but you find a way where they can get shelter? But you were the hands and feet of Christ in the community. And before I pray, I want to show us a, a video. You know, OCC, we have, like I said, we, we want to do more for our community. And we're going to find exceptional ways to do that. And we want to do stuff so much, and, and we love our community. And one of our core values is to make a, making a difference in our community. And OCC, we were trying to find a way to do stuff in the midst of COVID. But we wanted to love people. We wanted to show but one of the things that I realized through all that, and most people talk about the, the, the church of the pastor, the, the, you know, the church planter or lead pastor of the church and what they've done. I'm going to tell you all, this team is phenomenal. It wasn't me. It was them. They're phenomenal people, and they have, have sacrificed. And you know what? They came. Let me tell you about them just a little bit more. I mean, let, me get, let, me, let me gloat them just a little bit, right? They came. There was no dynamic youth ministry. There was no dynamic children's ministry yet, right? All this wasn't existing. All they had was what I said that I want to do, right? That's, you know, to be real, I mean, they all they heard, like, oh, Charles said this. They came in the midst of pandemic. They were willing to serve with masks on. 
They used to know sweating in a mask. And the place we're meeting smelled like socks sometimes. I'm, it's a dojo. That's what it is. And literally when you walk in, there's socks on the floor sometimes. You think I'm joking? Just visit. You'll see a sock. And they're willing to come out in the midst of a pandemic, even though you got to be six foot distance from people, and they're willing to come out in the midst of a pandemic, left comfort, they sacrificed financially, they sacrificed physically, they came. It had to be something in them to do it. And one thing we talked about every time in there, we're going to make disciples. And we talked about it so much, so much about making disciples, it's really bleeding out their ear. And then next week when we get back together, guess what we're going to talk about? Making disciples. And I told them in the beginning that we as a church, our job is to do what? Make disciples. Jesus tells in Matthew 28, 16, says, go out and make disciples. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations. Baptize the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them what I just taught you. And we're going to go back week after week. Guess what? We're going to talk about scripture. Hey, are we making disciples? And you know what? They've taken a charge on that. So I want to pray, and I want to show you this video. And I want you to kind of think about, you know, where am I? You know, the Lord may be calling some of y'all to come to OCC and help out with making disciples. Maybe. But it's going to take sacrifice. It's going to take work. You might not be comfortable all the time. And you get used to smelling socks. <laughs> so I want you to think about it. Even that, if the Lord keep you here in Northeast, are you serving in Northeast? Are you serving people around the community? Are you serving your neighbors? Are you serving people? Are you finding ways to do so? Lord, we just thank you for just the opportunity just to speak your word and to hear more about you. Lord, this is a, a, a great time for us to be in our community and show love to our community. There are a lot of people who are hurting. There are a lot of people who need to hear the gospel. There are a lot of people who need something to eat, need something, some clothes, and needing something. And Lord, you have given to the church to be this visible expression of the gospel. Lord, I pray that all of us will find ways to serve. If it's in the physical things of doing so, or just being a, a companionship with someone, just saying, hey, I'm here for you. I want to talk. If it's whatever you have called us to do, Lord, that we be that visible expression every single day of our life because our DNA has changed, that we love people so much because you first love us. And Lord, I pray that this message should be something that we all take and take up our mantle and make disciples and change this world. We ask this, your son, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Yeah, absolutely. So if you haven't figured it out yet, Northeast is a church planting church. It's part of the DNA because we were planted. We were planted by those who believe that God so loved the world that he gave up his only son. And so they gave up. They sacrificed financially. They sent some of their best people. And we, in turn, year after year, we save money, we invest, and we send out some of our best people. Many of the people you saw on the screen from Northeast committed to going and doing a new work in a new part of our city so that new families might come to hear the good news of Jesus. So one of our traditions at Northeast then is not just to invest this way, but to gather in these moments and commission off those that we have been um, leading, those that we have loved as family members, and those that we have been investing in as residents with us, including Charles and Brandy. Charles and Brandy, I just want to say thank you, first and foremost, for responding to God's call in your lives. I want to say thank you for leaning in in a season when so many churches were pulling out of church planting. So many pastors I was talking to were putting their plans on pause and and going back to doing other things. And you guys dug in. And you guys persisted in this, believing the very thing that you preached this morning, that disciples live differently and the church rises in these moments. And you guys have risen. And so we want to pray God's abundant blessing over one community. We want to challenge you again that you can partner with us both prayerfully. You can partner by considering going. They would love to talk to you about being a part of one community. And that doesn't mean you don't love us. It doesn't mean that you're like, we're not offended by that. We take that as a joy. We see that as a reward. And you can also partner through giving. Again, using our mobile site this morning to help them get across that finish line and launch and launch well. But part of our family tradition at Northeast is that we commission these people to service. We commission this new church. And so I'm going to ask you, would you stand with us this morning? In a moment, I'm going to ask Jerry Walker, the chairman of our elder board, to pray a prayer of commission. And I'm going to ask you, would you partner with us in this way? As we send them out, we're going to lay our hands on them. And I'm going to ask you, as a show of solidarity, a show of support, to do something maybe a little uncomfortable for you, and and even for those of you watching at home as well, would you be willing to just posture yourself in this way? This is is a sending out. This is a sending on mission. And it's us commissioning them in the power of Jesus Christ and through the power of the Holy Spirit for them to do a work that God has equipped them to do. And we show our solidarity when in these moments we pray alongside and we lay our hands on, sometimes physically in a pandemic, maybe virtually, but certainly symbolically. Would you just outstretch your hand and would you pray with us over them and over their team this morning? Well, Charles, even before we pray and as we keep our hands extended, brother, I'm just so excited and so proud and so thankful for this time because God specializes in making something out of nothing. Look at us. We're nothing. He made something. And so praise God, brother. Someone told me a long time ago that Christians are like sponges. When they're squeezed, what's in them comes out of them. And you and I have talked about this day and the many challenges that you and your dear wife and others have made in coming to this time. And brother, I found so thankful that the DNA in you, just as you preached this morning, has resulted in that service to others. And so even at this time, brother, I pray and, uh, and, and just before we bow our heads, one of my visual aids is, is Peter walking on water. And I know that's what Jesus wants us to do. But the only way he could walk was keep his focus on Christ. And we knew the enemy kicked up the wind and the waves. And as long as he was watching, had his eyes on Jesus, he continued to walk. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you. And we praise you. And we lift up your name above every name at this time. 
Lord, as we commission our dear brother Charles, and as they launch out in this new work, Father, you said the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. You also said, Lord, we can do nothing without you. And so, Lord, we commission them at this time. We join in this work with them. Lord, praising your name and realizing, Father, that it's your work that you've accomplished. It's your work that you will complete. We pray that you use Charles. Strengthen him for the days ahead. Lord, give him wisdom. Lord, increase his faith. And not just his, but all those who would join in this work with him. Oh, Father, we lift this up to you. We praise you and thank you and give you the glory and honor. And Lord, ask that you send him out, borne up on eagles' wings. And Father, that you make his road smooth in front of him. Lord, as he keeps his focus and his eyes on you. And finally, Lord, I pray that, Lord, even as he goes, that he would focus on you, die to self, and continue to give to others. For it's in Jesus' matchless name we pray. And all the church could say, amen and amen. Hey, thank them one last time. Send them off with your appreciation. We've been challenged and we've been commissioned. You too are called to go and make disciples. And as we've heard today, disciples live different. You're called to be a servant. So go this week with eyes to see whom God would call you to serve with your life. And go knowing that if he's called you to serve them, he will strengthen and equip you to do exactly that. Can't wait to see you next weekend. Until then, God bless.